This video focuses on the structural properties and main biological functions associated with the class of biomolecules called lipids. Lipids are a very diverse class of molecule, and the term lipid really just describes molecules that don't interact well with water, so they're essentially nonpolar and hydrophobic. We'll focus on the most important lipids in cells, and as we did with carbohydrates, we'll want to understand the connections between the structural and chemical properties of these compounds and the functions that they're associated with. Analogous to the energy storage polysaccharides we've already discussed, lipids are also associated with energy storage. Both plants and animals store chemical energy in the molecules called triacylglycerol, also referred to as triglycerides or fats and oils. In addition to energy storage, lipids make up the backbone of cellular membranes, which serve as a barrier between the cell and its exterior environment or between different cellular compartments. Finally, lipids play important roles in cell signaling. Steroid hormones like estrogen, testosterone, and corticosteroids are synthesized from cholesterol, which is a lipid, and these regulate development, growth, reproduction, stress response, and other critical biological functions in animals. Prostaglandins are another class of lipid that play important roles in inflammation and immune response. We won't spend much time on their roles in signaling, though. Our primary focus will be on energy storage lipids and those in cellular membranes. Plants and animals store energy in the form of triacylglycerol. Structurally, these are composed of one glycerol, here at the top, and three individual fatty acids that are covalently linked to the glycerol via dehydration synthesis. Fatty acids are so named because structurally they consist of long hydrocarbon chains, which as we've discussed before, are nonpolar. That's the fatty part. With a carboxyl group at the end of the chain, the acid part. When they're linked together, we get this molecule, the triacylglycerol or triglyceride, which is synonymous with the terms fat and oil. These fatty acids are energy-rich molecules. These bonds are oxidized in cells in similar fashion to what happens to glucose to yield energy for ATP synthesis. This is a topic that we'll investigate in more depth in our energetics unit. But until their energy is needed, animals store them away in specialized adipose tissue and plants store them in oil droplets, most commonly found in seeds, to provide energy required for growth of the embryonic plant. The terms fat and oil are somewhat arbitrarily used to describe triacylglycerols that tend to form solid aggregates at room temperature, mostly but not exclusively found in animals, versus those that remain liquid at room temperature, mostly those in plants. This property is determined by the structure of the fatty acids in the triacylglycerol molecule and whether they contain double bonds or not. Fatty acids that contain only single bonds along the carbon chain are referred to as saturated fatty acids. Each carbon atom is bonded to the maximum number of hydrogen atoms, two, it could be, along the chain since there are no double bonds. Unsaturated fatty acids contain one or more double bonds along the chain. And as a result, each of the carbons participating in the double bond is bonded to only one hydrogen atom, otherwise they would exceed their valence. In nearly all naturally occurring fatty acids, the three-dimensional orientation of the ends of the hydrocarbon chain on either side of the double bond is the cis orientation, meaning on the same side of the double bond. Structurally, cis double bonds introduce a bend in the hydrocarbon tail, and this bend is responsible for the difference in physical properties of fats and oils. Since fats contain a prevalence of saturated fatty acids, these molecules have a flat linear structure and they can stack one on top of the other, resulting in a higher melting point. Whereas the bends introduced in the backbone of unsaturated fatty acids tend to break up those sorts of close stacking interactions, causing oils to be more fluid and liquid at room temperature. Double bonds in the trans configuration are not common in nature, but they can be introduced during industrial processes that are used in food manufacture, specifically when unsaturated fats are hydrogenated to cause them to have properties that are more similar to saturated fats, things like consistency and increased shelf life. This hydrogenation process can result in fatty acids that take on the trans configuration. And for reasons that are not clearly understood as yet, these unnatural fatty acids seem to have an inflammation-promoting effect on cells that line blood vessels, which the evidence suggests can promote cardiovascular disease. That's why you see no trans fats all over food packages now and why some states have banned the use of these in commercial food preparation. But both saturated and unsaturated fatty acids work well as energy reserves for a couple of reasons. 
First, since the carbons of the hydrocarbon backbone are in a reduced state, these carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds hold more potential energy than we'd see if there were lots of hydroxyls bonded along the chain like we see in carbohydrates. Second, since these molecules are largely nonpolar, they don't interact well with water, so they're not hydrated in cells. The consequence of this is that animals don't have to carry around excess water, which is heavy, in order to keep them dissolved. We should note before moving on that adipose tissue has other biologically important functions in addition to energy storage, including serving as an insulating buoyant layer of fat in aquatic animals and generating heat in infants and hibernating animals. Let's talk about the role of lipids in making up cellular membranes. The class of lipids that we're mostly focusing on here is the glycerophospholipid, which is somewhat similar to the triacylglycerol molecules we just discussed, but with some important distinctions in terms of structure and chemical properties. Here we're looking at the generalized structure of a glycerophospholipid. We'll just call it a phospholipid for short. Like in the fats and oils, glycerol provides the backbone for these molecules, and we also see two fatty acids linked to the glycerol backbone. In this case, though, only two fatty acid tails linked to two carbons of the three-carbon glycerol. I want to take a, mo a moment to make sure that you recognize what's being depicted in this drawing. As I mentioned when we discussed carbohydrates, often when drawing organic compounds, the carbon atoms won't be explicitly drawn in in the structure. We really only need to note the atom if it's not carbon. So these fatty acid tail drawings are a sort of shorthand way of depicting a long hydrocarbon, where we just know that at the end of each of these bonds there's a carbon atom, unless otherwise noted. And we also just have to know that each carbon will be bonded to enough hydrogen atoms to complete its valence. Okay, so if only two fatty acid tails are bonded to the glycerol, what about the third carbon? Here's where we see a significant difference. The third carbon is bonded to a phosphate functional group, which is negatively charged. And this phosphate, in turn, is bonded to another group that can vary. Commonly, we're talking about choline, serine, or inositol. This group, symbolized by the letter R, can vary, but it's going to be a polar or charged ionic group of atoms. This structural difference has important consequences, because what we end up with is a molecule that on one end is made up of hydrocarbon tails that water doesn't readily interact with. So this end of the phospholipid would be hydrophobic. And on the other side of this molecule, we've got charge and polarity, which water will readily surround in a hydration shell. So this end is hydrophilic, and this lends a dual nature to the molecule. We call this being amphipathic. Phospholipids are commonly drawn in shorthand notation like this, with a hydrophilic head group and two hydrophobic fatty acid tails. So how does this amphipathic nature affect these molecules in an aqueous environment? We can imagine that if you threw a bunch of phospholipids into a beaker of water, what would happen is that the water would start forming hydrogen bonds and dipole charge interactions with the polar and charged head regions of the phospholipids. But interactions between the water molecules and the nonpolar tails would not be energetically favored, so they would be excluded from interaction with water. And what you might end up with is a structure that looks like this, what we would call a micelle a sphere in which all of the hydrophilic head groups are facing and bonding with the water molecules, but all of the hydrophobic tails are directed toward the interior of the sphere, essentially by being excluded from interactions with water. It's important to note here that the hydrophobic tails are not attracted to one another. They're sort of forced into the interior because water molecules would rather make bonds with other water molecules or with the polar or charged phospholipid head. So what's sometimes called the hydrophobic effect is really just exclusion from interaction with water. The water is not really repelling the tails, it would just rather play with someone else. As these micelles get large, they become structurally unstable, with gaps between the heads and empty space in the middle, so larger structures would form, which we would call liposomes. These are also spherical, but comprised of two layers of phospholipids directed tail to tail such that the interior space can accommodate water, interacting once again with the polar or charged head groups, and the hydrophilic heads on the outer layer would also be interacting with water. But in the interior of the bilayer would be the hydrophobic tails, and water would not be present here. This bilayer structure that we can see forming spontaneously in liposomes is fundamentally exactly the same structure that makes up all cellular membranes.
Here we have another depiction of the phospholipid molecule and the arrangement of these phospholipids as we would find them in a cellular membrane. Just like in the liposome, the hydrophobic tails are directed toward the interior of the bilayer, and the hydrophilic head groups are interacting with water both inside and outside the cell. This bilayer forms a very effective barrier against the uncontrolled passage of materials across the cellular membrane, which is critically important for a cell to be able to keep the good stuff in and the bad stuff out. Now why would that be the case? Well, think about it. What's here on the inside of the cell? Aqueous solutions with tons of molecules and ions dissolved in solution. What's outside the cell? Same thing. So in order for a substance to pass directly through this phospholipid bilayer, it would have to be able to dissolve into the hydrophobic interior of the bilayer to get across. But solutes dissolved in water are typically polar or charged, so most things won't be able to cross the bilayer directly. They will have to be provided a path in the form of a transport protein in order to get across. We'll talk a lot more about regulation of membrane transport later in the course, but right now it's important to recognize the link between the chemical properties of the phospholipids that make up the bulk of the membrane and the function of the membrane as a protective barrier against the uncontrolled movement of materials in and out of the cell. Another thing that we should note here is that these phospholipids are associating with one another in this fashion and orientation driven by interactions or lack thereof with water molecules. These molecules are not covalently bonded to one another, so membranes are fluid structures which allow molecules to move laterally past one another in the plane of the membrane as long as the interactions of those hydrophilic heads with water is maintained. In other words, we don't see very much of phospholipids flipping from the outer leaflet of the membrane to the inner leaflet, for example, but lateral diffusion is tolerated. As we'll see, this fluid property that membranes have is really important. Membranes are not static structures. Membranes can be induced to merge with one another and to separate, and the fact that these phospholipids are not covalently bonded to one another allows that to happen. Otherwise, membranes would be more like a solid wall. Membrane fusion is hugely important from everything from fertilization of an egg to transport of materials within a cell to the ability of neurons in the brain to communicate with one another, as we'll see in this brief animation produced by Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. This animation shows the process of neuronal communication that allows the nervous system to act as command and control center. Typically, one neuron will communicate with another by releasing chemical signals called neurotransmitters, which will then bind to receptors on the target cell to initiate a response. These chemicals are held in these membrane-enclosed compartments called vesicles inside the neuron until it's stimulated to release them into the gap between cells, what's called a synapse. The way that the cell does that is by controlled merging of the membranes of this compartment with the cellular membrane which releases the interior contents to the outside environment. This is controlled by fusion proteins. These two bilayers are essentially pulled so close to one another that the water molecules between them get pushed out and the two bilayers merge to form a single bilayer. The important point to recognize here is that this sort of fusion event is made possible by the non-covalent nature of the association of these phospholipids, the fluidity of the membrane. On the other hand, it wouldn't be a good thing for the membrane to become too fluid. If the phospholipid bilayer becomes too disordered, then gaps between the phospholipids will appear, which will allow uncontrolled passage of materials through the membrane. So cells have to really regulate how fluid their membranes are, and one way that they do that is through the inclusion of sterile molecules like cholesterol in the membrane. Here's the structure of cholesterol on the left. It's made up of four fused hydrocarbon rings, a short hydrocarbon tail, and one hydroxyl functional group over here. In terms of structure, the rings form a sort of a flat planar surface. It has a bit of a staggered molecular structure, and in terms of chemical properties, it's largely hydrophobic, except for its one hydroxyl group, which we know is polar. When cholesterol is inserted into the membrane, it's oriented such that this hydroxyl group is interacting with the hydrophilic phospholipid heads, and the rest of the cholesterol molecule is within the hydrophobic membrane interior. Cholesterol's presence in animal cell membranes has two seemingly contradictory effects. 
If the membrane lipids are stacking too tightly, as might happen with a drop in temperature, for example, or if there's a prevalence of saturated fatty acid tails, cholesterol's irregular structure will tend to break up the stacking interactions to promote more fluidity. On the other hand, if the membrane is too fluid, as might happen with increased temperature or prevalence of unsaturated fatty acid tails, cholesterol's planar hydrophobic rings will tend to interact with and stabilize the interactions between the adjacent phospholipids, causing the membrane to take on a more ordered state. So in the same way that a buffer can moderate changes in pH of a solution, cholesterol can moderate changes in membrane fluidity. Cholesterol is the sterol used in animals, but plants also use structurally related phytosterols in their cellular membranes, and these provide similar effects. I want to very briefly mention that glycerophospholipids and cholesterol are not the only types of membrane lipid. Sphingolipids are also present, and these have important functional roles to play, as we'll discuss later when we look at membrane structure and function in more detail. Sphingolipids are not based on a backbone of glycerol, but rather on a molecule called sphingosine, shown here at the top. Sphingosine contains a long hydrocarbon tail of its own, and then a fatty acid would be covalently bonded to the nitrogen here, and another group which will vary will be here. Just like in the glycerophospholipids, that's often phosphocholine, a phosphate bonded to choline. If we compare the structures of the head groups of glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids, we can definitely see the similarity. We'll talk more about these, but I just wanted to briefly mention their existence here for the sake of completeness. Also in the interest of full disclosure and accuracy, in this discussion of membrane structure, we've simplified things quite a bit. We've only discussed a few types of lipids, we've had no real discussion of protein, and I might have left you with the impression that because of membrane fluidity, membrane components are diffusing laterally in uncontrolled fashion, leading to a very homogeneous mixture of membrane components. But as we'll see in more detail in a couple of weeks, that's not the case. Membrane structure is highly organized and regulated. The different colors of this diagram of the cellular membrane represent different classes of membrane lipids, which are often organized into domains like we see here. These peach-colored blobs represent proteins with various functions, including receptors, enzymes, transport, and many of the proteins and lipids we see here are glycosylated. We've already discussed the significance of that. In other words, we've only scratched the surface on cellular membranes, and we'll continue this discussion later on in the course. In this video, we've reviewed some major biological functions associated with lipids. We've investigated the structures of fats and oils, and that of glycerophospholipids, sphingolipids, and cholesterol. And we've related their structural and chemical properties to their functions and interactions in a watery environment. We've gotten a very brief introduction to cellular membranes and discussed how their biochemical makeup is related to their ability to prevent the unregulated passage of materials in and out of cells. In the next video, we'll tackle the largest and most diverse class of biomolecules, the proteins.